Hello, welcome back to another Monday night edition of the Wolverine live show here on Wolverine.com's YouTube channel. Also, after the fact, in all of our podcast feeds, for those of you who can't make it live. Anthony Broom here on a Monday night, uh, as we are always with Clayton Safey and Chris Ballas coming off of, uh, obviously, Big Ten Tournament last week, Selection Sunday. Michigan basketball is in the NIT. We'll hit on that. I want to do kind of an overarching look at the the season that was for Michigan basketball. It's not quite over yet, but we will talk about that now that we're a few days removed from uh, a bit of a stinker, uh, to, to put it nicely, in the Big Ten Tournament. But before we get started... I want to talk about our friends over at Vitamin Energy. Vitamin Energy is a powerful, naturally caffeinated energy shot that nourishes your body with vitamins, supports healthy weight loss, and boosts energy for seven plus hours with no jitters or sugar crash. That's the key part in all of this. So uh, they made sure they got samples out to all of us. I've got mine right here. Probably going to take one after the show for a little extra kick. Uh, we got a magazine week coming up, so we'll need a, an extra boost there. Uh, never a bad time to add a little jolt to your day. So uh, Vitamin Energy's mission is to make people healthier and more energized one day at a time. There are benefits in every single shot. They're naturally caffeinated uh, with green tea extract, gluten-free, vegan and kosher certified, and keto-friendly, zero sugars and artificial flavors, zero carbs. There's something for everyone, immune and mood boosters, B12, vitamin D, workout plus, sports plus, focus shots, and much more. No jitters, no crash, supports gut health. Uh, we could all use more of that probably. Energy with benefits. Let us help you through, uh, let us help get you through your day. Be the best version of yourself. They are made in the USA. They are small but mighty shots. Vitaminenergy.com. Use promo code Wolverine Bogo. That's uh, Wolverine B O G O for buy one, get one free over at their website. And of course, if you're watching us on YouTube, you can check that offer out below. Fellas, uh, Selection Sunday in the books here. Michigan, as expected, did not make the NCAA tournament, but are in the NIT. There was some confusion because of the NIT. Uh, originally, they were put out in a bracket as the number two seed in their region. They are a three seed and will play Toledo uh, on Tuesday night. Uh, the three of us will be there. We might be the only three people in the Michigan universe that isn't associated with the program that will be locked into and paying attention to this game, but... Um, 17 and 15 uh, to end the regular season. We'll talk NIT draw in a little bit. Um, but now that we're a couple days removed from the Big Ten tournament, I know Clayton and I were on uh, Friday evening as we kind of put a bow on what the Big Ten tournament was. But uh, 17 and 15, uh, was probably the 18 or 19 wins would have been what got them what got them in. Although Rutgers, we thought would get in with a win over Michigan, make that first four, didn't happen. They are also in the NIT. Now, I want to start with this, and I guess we'll start with Chris on this one. Now that we're a few days removed from, let's face it, I mean, what happens in the NIT isn't going to write, rewrite the narrative of this season. Uh, if they win right away, people will be, or if they win the whole thing, people are going to be pissed off that they didn't find a way to put together their best basketball sooner. If they lose, people are going to be fuming, but they've been fuming all year, so uh, not a whole lot to, to change there. But now that we're a few days removed from that Rutgers game, what what sticks out to you most about this season and, and what, I guess, your summation of what this year was? Yeah, it, to me, it was a team that didn't take the first part of the year seriously enough. And we can sit there and talk about improvement and young team and everything like that. But when you lose to Central Michigan and you go to overtime with Ohio and Lipscomb takes you to the wire and Eastern Michigan, then you're doing something wrong. And I'm not going to blame that on youth or anything but a team that wasn't prepared to come out and play good basketball. And let's be fair, if they had beaten Central Michigan, they would probably be in the tournament, right? I don't think there's any question about it or damn close to it. Uh, Rutgers. Uh, you know what? Rutgers is not Michigan. So we can say that, well, Michigan maybe wouldn't have gotten into the tournament anyway, but we know people close to the committee that said, well, they passed the look test. You know what? They could get the Syracuse treatment, you know, where Syracuse sneaks in as an 11 seed and does some damage. And uh, because of their name, they get into the tournament. And Michigan made some waves as an 11 seed last year, obviously. Uh, this year, they didn't get the luxury because they laid an egg against Rutgers. Uh, and frankly, what was an embarrassing performance? We can 
you know, you can try to spin it any way you want to, but that just uh, was unacceptable and reminded me a lot of the Tommy Amaker year in which they needed to beat Minnesota in the first round of the Big Ten tournament to probably get a bid, laid an egg in that one too. So, and against the team that they had blown out at their place. So it is what it is, fellas. Next year needs to be better. I thought Dan Dockett really came strong on the huge show. Uh, analysts saying that, you know, the further you get removed, he called it the Mike Davis syndrome or something like that, or an area over at Indiana. You know what? The further you get, they got away from Bob Knight, the worse they got to the point where Davis had to resign in 2006. I don't think we're there. I don't think we're close to that yet. Um, and I didn't think that his criticism of Hunter Dickinson was warranted. I thought Hunter Dickinson played his butt off uh, most of the year. There were a couple games, of course, but he's lugging, you know, 250, 160 pounds up and down the court. Does need to get in better shape next year if he returns, and I think he will. But all in all, a big disappointment. I uh, hate the NIT with all due respect to the people who run that tournament. It is no fun to cover. It's no fun to watch. It is a second-class tournament, and we'll be there to cover every every step of the way for you, FIFA folks. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge, huge disappointment when you start out preseason ranked number 22 and you end up in the NIT. And it's been a really long time since Michigan's been in this tournament and uh, in very NIT fashion, as Anthony mentioned. Flipping up this or, mix, you know, mixing up those seeds is just it just tells you everything you need to know about the NIT. Again, no offense to the fantastic committee over there that runs the tournament, but uh, just crazy. But, yeah, I, I agree with what you're talking about with the beginning of the season. That's two years in a row now where Michigan has really failed to do anything in non-conference play. It set them back a, a ton. I think they were, what, 500 after losing to UCF uh, two years ago. Uh, really similar timed game against Central Michigan where they uh, laid that egg and really a loss that held them back the whole season. So they got to figure that out. And guess what would help? Some continuity. So, you know, getting guys back is going to be really key because you don't want to every year have to be figuring out what the team's going to look like, you know, molding all the pieces together. You want to be able to hit the ground running a little bit uh, more, which which would help you and and set you up for this time of year. If you do go through a rough patch, you could still have a little bit of a cushion there to make the tournament. But yeah, I mean, this program uh, expects to not only make the tournament but make runs in the tournament. Twenty three NCAA tournament wins over the last ten years. Uh, so it's not something that Jawan Howard and this program can accept not making it. Um, you can though do what you can in, in the NIT, try to win it. Uh, I liked what some of the guys were saying in their statements last night that. They still have a chance to play for a championship. I mean, it is what it is at this point. North Carolina bows out, you know, and says that they can't reach their goals, so they're not going to play in the NIT. You know, well, Michigan had the same goals, and, and they're going to be there as well because they don't deserve to be in the NCAA tournament. Neither team does. Um, and, you know, that that's kind of where things are. you got to accept the facts of where you're at. You could do something here in the next couple of weeks. And the last five teams to win the, the NIT tournament – are in this year's NCAA tournament, including Penn State in the Big Ten, who won in 2018. Both finalists from last year, Texas A&M and Xavier, which ultimately won it, uh, are teams that people are looking at as potentially dangerous teams this season. So uh, build off of this. You need guys to come back, but um, you know they can still they can still uh, hang a banner. I guess I don't. I wouldn't. I don't want to hang a banner if you're Michigan with something like this. But you can still cut down some nets, uh, win some games and have your young team play a little bit more and gain some more experience. Put the banner in the practice facility for the NIT. Yeah, it's motivation, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing to me is that you don't get to, you know, from a – I know there was some de debate on, <clears throat> on social media, on the message board. Do you even accept a bid? Yeah, you accept a bid because the alternative is that you're North Carolina and you get roasted for not being able – or not being willing to compete. Um you know, you don't get to sit there and, and thumb your nose at the NIT or puff your chest out that it's beneath you when you didn't do enough to get to where um, where you wanted to be, obviously. So, you know, I like I like that Michigan isn't, you know, sticking its tail between its legs and, you know, calling it an end of the season. Now, if they had done that, I don't know if I would have blamed them. I know it's been a it's been an emotional year, but, you know, if you're if your program's motto is for competitors only, you better play the games. And, and if you're going to get invited you may as well play. If you're going to play, you may as well win the games. And Hey, you know what? I, I know it's not, it's not what was intended and it's not, again, it's not really going to move the needle with the fan base or anything like that, but um, you know, postseason basketball and, and playing on short turnarounds, those are all things that you know, a fairly young team can learn from. Like Clayton said, with all those teams that are in the field this year uh, that, 
you know, have been in the NIT recently. So um, I guess just the season in general or, or what comes next, because, you know, the NIT, I, I don't know if the NIT is going to change, like I said, going to change any narratives, going to change anyone's decision in terms of, do I come back for the MB or do I come back? Do I go to the NBA? But you know, what's when we get to the off season here, which could come as soon as tomorrow night, it could come, you know, March 30th after Michigan wins the NIT in Vegas. What's the biggest, I guess my biggest question right now is what is the priority of this off season? It's not, you know, I don't know that you can flip your entire roster. Like we've seen a lot of teams do through the transfer portal. Though I think that's going to be an important thing for them to get. This team needs to get deeper. I think that's what sticks out the most for me. But when you look at what ails this program, uh, we've had a lot of time to write about it, a lot of time to think about it over the last few days. How do you make sure this doesn't happen again through what you attack this off season? I wrote in on Friday morning a few things that needed to happen. And one of them, in my opinion, is one of the biggest is that they have got to have better chemistry between, OK, what are the roles here? Is, is Jet Howard you know, going to be that guy? Is Kobe Bufkin going to be the man at the end of games? How are those guys going to exist together? I think that, uh, you know, it was interesting. I was on Stu Douglas's podcast and he said there was rivalry between him and Zach Novak the first two years. And neither one of these guys was the, you know, was the alpha on that team. They were both contributors on, on some good teams, but uh, they weren't the guy at the end of the game that was having the ball and, and taking that game winning shot, so on and so forth. And he said there was a rivalry there. Uh, so there's some kind of a, there's a natural rivalry, frankly, uh, among some of these kids. And I'm not saying that Kobe Bufkin and Jet Howard don't get along, but you've got to find ways to make sure that, okay, you're playing to their strengths and, to the point that everybody's on board with it. There were times this year uh, and, and not to rip on Jet Howard where his teammates, you know, he got a lot of looks and in, in a lot of games where they're looking at him like, what the hell are you doing? You know, why, why didn't you box out? Why did you do this? Why didn't you do that uh, type of thing? And, um, and it wasn't, it wasn't because he missed a shot or it wasn't because, you know, he drove into traffic or something like that. These are basics, boxing out a free throw shooter or not boxing out on somebody who goes in for a putback. So he's got to earn the trust back of his teammates, in my opinion, in terms of doing those things on the floor. Number one, number two, Hunter Dickinson's got to come back and he's got to be in incredible shape. He's got to, he's got to get back to where, okay. Uh, he's looking ripped right now. He looks out there with all due respect to him. He's got a little bit of dad bod going on there, I think. Right. And it's I, at the very least, it doesn't look like he is in the best shape of that he's been at, at Michigan. And I think if he did were to do that, uh, then he could reach all of his professional goals as well, uh, whether it's the NBA, whether it's overseas, whatever. Uh, I am not here to rip on Hunter Dickinson, who I think is fantastic. And some people do. I think he's been the reason that they were even close to the tournament this year, frankly. Uh, where would they have been without him? You know, I uh, look at Rutgers and he was out there carrying the water for everybody. So uh, those are just a couple of things. And then, of course, the roster. They need more depth so that they can have that accountability. If somebody's not running the floor and playing as hard as they should be, you've got somebody to replace them. They need some help at the four. They need a shooter. Uh, they need more shooters. And, uh, you know, uh, frankly, that's where it starts. I wrote, too, that, you know, this team might have been better off with Brandon Johns, which a lot of people, they were so quick to get rid of him last year. And now he's got a championship with VCU. So those are a few things. And then some of it will come naturally, fellas. Like Doug McDaniel is going to be a year better. He's going to improve. Kobe Bufkin, if he returns, is going to be all the better for it. But uh, that's, to me, where it all starts. Yeah, to me, it is the roster. I mean, we could talk all we want about what role Jet Howard's going to be in, but is he going to be here next season? Same with Kobe Bufkin. You know, you got to make sure Hunter Dickinson gets back. I completely agree. He's the number one priority for me. If I'm managing that roster, which of course no one would ever allow me to manage a roster, but I would. Want I would. Dickinson, or, well, I would take that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd probably run some program into the ground, but uh, you know, whatever. Um, you know, guy. so Hunter is kind of the key to everything. Where would the Jawan Howard era be without Hunter Dickinson if he wasn't able to land him? And that's, you know, it's not unfair to say, but it's it's you know you could say that for a lot of programs, right? With who's their best player or whatever. But you know, you're talking about a guy who's been here three years now, potentially four. Uh, he has an extra year eligibility after that, really. So uh, he's been really important. He's been the guy, the catalyst to everything, as much criticism as he gets. Um, so that's that's number one as well. But to me, it's bringing in transfers on the wing. It's bringing in transfers in the backcourt, depending on who leaves. And those have to be really good additions. Those are can be kind of hit or miss, as we have seen. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's going to be really important for Jawan Howard and his staff to identify the right guys, be able to land them, even when you think you have a guy maybe 
you don't have a guy and they go to another Big Ten team, uh, and you know that could happen as well. So it's a it's a slippery slope with the transfer portal, but it's managing that roster and then finding an identity for what you want this team to look like. I thought Dan Dockich to bring him up uh, again made some good points about you know wh- what is. Michigan basketball under Juwan Howard, they've had really good identities on on different teams, but uh, you know they've kind of lost that the last couple of seasons. Are they going to be an elite defensive team? Uh, personnel helps a lot there, obviously, but you know get back to basics there. Uh, get back to defining some of the roles on offense, things like that. Um, you know, and Hunter Dickinson being there, I think, will help with that with that um, you know identity as well. But yeah, there's a lot to attack. There's also going to be a lot of waiting to see who is going to be on this team. Um, and I'll be really interested to see how they approach the NIT in terms of are we going to see some more young guys? Is he going to open up the rotation a little bit more? Or is this going to be the main guys saying, you know, we want to go out and win some games or whatever? Um, so that'll be really, really interesting to see how they approach that because this is kind of like one of those quote unquote meaningless bowl games where you, you kind of are in the in between this season and the next season and you know all that really matters right now is the next season uh so do what you can right now to set yourself up nicely but man they got a lot of work to do this offseason yeah i think for me it starts with the depth you know i'd love to see guys like yusef kayat and uh and isaiah barnes who hasn't played well when he's gotten into games this year i'd like to see those guys get in maybe a little bit more and uh you know the reason i think what ailed this team the most is the fact that uh, you know, Chris kind of alluded to it. There is, is when guys weren't playing well or were making mistakes, who do you go to on the bench? I mean, Joey Baker is a guy that, you know, if you play him more than 20 minutes a game, I don't know that um, from a physical perspective, he's someone that could hold up with that. You know, he had a hip surgery, been around the block, uh, brings good energy, but um, you know, you need, you need those guys that kind of burn to win coming off the bench, like a Chondi Brown, like a, um, you know, you don't want, there can't be such a huge drop off, I guess. And some of those weird lineup combinations is, is because Juwan is trying to find who the, those best five guys are on that second unit. And, and, you know, obviously when you lose Jalen Llewellyn to a torn ACL, that shifts some things around and, and it affects your depth. And maybe he's back next year. And, um, you know, I think that if he does come back, it helps, but it's not, you know, it's not the be all end all. So I, I think a lot of it comes down to depth and roster construction. Um, I think that, uh, Michigan Rick acts about uh, you know only two commits coming in next year. Will Juwan Howard hit the portal hard? Uh, I mean, I, I think they're always looking at it. I think that's always something that's on the table for them. Would love to see if they could go in the portal and grab a starting four. But again, a lot of those guys, you know, if you're going to, a lot of those guys who are transferring up are also kind of looking for NIL. And we know that Michigan hasn't really done a superb job in, in any of its sports on that front, which is something I'm sure we'll, we'll get to a little bit later on, but, um, I also think that on the offensive and defensive end of the floor, I think that they can, you know, you have to go back, you have to go back to reestablishing the basics, the fundamentals of the game. I mean, a lot of these losses they had were because, you know, guys aren't boxing out correctly or um, someone loses their man on defense or, you know, just a lack of execution, lack of effort in some pretty simple basketball areas in, in places that, uh, you know, you know, we talk about boxing out. You learn how to do that it, before you even dribble a basketball. I feel like in a lot of places. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, final question on this team, and then we'll talk about our friends over at the Rogue Shop. Nit. Obviously, you're getting a, a team on Tuesday in Toledo at Chrysler Center. Uh, as it turned out, uh, Senior Day wasn't the last game uh, in <clears throat> Ann Arbor for a lot of these players, uh, which. I feel like we had mentioned that at some point Uh, it it feels kind of darkly prophetic that that's the situation they're in now. Uh, But Toledo comes into town, a team that, you know, would have been, I think Clayton, you had said something along the lines of maybe like a 13 seed in the NCAA tournament team that likes to, to fill it up from three, a lot of guys that can shoot for a Michigan team that has kind of struggled at times defensively, especially defending the perimeter. I think this is a, uh, I really could see this one going either way, but what, uh, you know, what constitutes success in this tournament now? Because I know a lot of people are tuned out. A lot of people will focus on their brackets and, and, and the big tournament, and rightfully so. It's the one that matters. But where is the juice for this tournament? And what can we – is there anything we can learn by this game Tuesday night about the metal of this program, the culture of this program? 
Uh, the only thing that is g- g- successful is if you win the thing uh, or just, you know, get to the final four in Vegas so that Clayton can go to one of those shows where they sp- spin on the rings and the and stuff like that. What are they called? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Anyway, what are the shows? I've never been to Vegas, man. I want to go. Really? Well, there you go. Uh, he wants to see Barry Manilow. So we'll see. Um, we'll see what we can do. So that's what that's what constitutes success. Uh, we're talking about maybe a road trip and uh, to Vegas. I actually put it on the board on the message board. Would you go if Michigan were in the Final Four in Vegas just for the trip to Vegas? And the, I think the results of the poll were a resounding no. I think it was like ninety eight percent to two percent. And uh, one guy said, yeah, Cirque du Soleil. Thanks, Dave. So, Dave, if you can hook up Clay with tickets, just DM him after the fact. Uh, he would love that. So hit, me up. hit, me up. hit him up. So uh, anyway, so that's um, – yeah, it, you know what? I, I remember – Watching, God, I'll go way back, guys. 1984, they were, Tim McCormick was playing in it uh, for Michigan, and they had a red, white, and blue basketball. And I was so excited. That's back when the NCAA tournament was only 32 teams. Michigan won the thing, and uh, it was fun to watch. It isn't that way anymore, guys. Uh, and, in fact, it'd be great if they would expand the uh, NCAA tournament field to, like, 90 so we never had to have this feeling again because I would rather lose than that in one of the several play-in games than – then have to go through this with all, again with all due respect, you know, to the to the NIT people. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. So anyway, uh, that you got to win it, guys. That's all there is to it. If now that you're in it, uh, I don't have any confidence that this team is going to come and show up and play hard enough to win this thing. I just don't. Uh, after what I saw against Rutgers, and of course they've surprised me many times this year. So who knows? Yeah, with all due respect, uh, you can kind of say that, and then you can just say whatever you want. Uh, we <laughs> exactly. That well, sure, as heck, it sure as heck does. Yeah, it sure <laughs> as heck does. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, success in this tournament, I, I don't know. Like, to me, that word doesn't even necessarily apply. I guess, Like, it would be a success to win this tournament. It wouldn't change the fact that this season was not successful. Um, but, hey, I mean, the burden's off a little bit. Go out there, play loose, have some fun. Uh, win as many games as you can and kind of see where the chips fall after that, you know, get some experience for these guys. If you're a guy like Doug McDaniel, you know, I mean, just, just kind of take this experience and, you know, continue to learn, continue to uh, take over that point guard spot and and other guys as well, whatever role you're given in this thing. Uh, That's all you can really ask for. The guys compete hard. I was watching Hunter Dickinson was on live on his podcast round ball last night during the selection show. And he was with a bunch of his teammates and when they got selected I mean, I know people probably make fun of them for it, but they were kind of – they were having some fun. They were cheering. You know, they were joking about how this is an ex- the, a more exclusive tournament than the NCAA tournament. Like, so go out there and have some fun, um, you know, and, and do this thing. I mean, Toledo is a team that I, I think so, Anthony, would probably be around a 13 seed. That's what Kent State is at out of the MAC, and Toledo was the, the favorite in the uh, – heading into the MAC tournament. They lose that game to Kent State. And here they are. Uh, they still haven't made the NCAA tournament since 1980. Uh, and they, so that's a huge drought for them. But this is a really good offensive team. They're the most offense def- dependent team in the entire country, fifth nationally on Ken Palm in efficiency and 287th in defense. Uh, you know, they got shooters all over the floor. They're going to space the floor. They're going to challenge Michigan. At the same time, I think Hunter Dickinson could get probably 30 with ease if he wants to. Uh, because you know the tallest guy they start is six foot seven, um, but it's it's going to be a challenge in the backcourt. Uh, they have Ray J. Dennis. His first name is Ray J. Guys, uh, and he is the MAC Player of the Year, unanimous first team all uh, all MAC selection, and uh, you know so he's going to be tough to stop for those guys. But you know, see what happens. Uh, I'll be curious to see how many fans show out. I'll be curious to see how many Toledo fans come up. And uh, I'll be curious to see the way Michigan comes out, what kind of effort they give. But, yeah, success, I, I don't even know. Just that thats that burden's off right now. Just go win some games. Yeah, no one's going to be watching. So it really doesn't matter, like, how well you play. Because if you lose, people will be like, well, of course they lost. And if with all win, due respect. Like, oh, well, yeah, with all due respect. No, 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 actually, no, re- no respect intended at all. Um, <laughs> Hasn't it been around longer than, than uh, the NCAA? So I think it is. It's more oh exclusive. God. It has more tradition in terms of years than the NCAA <laughs> tournament. I mean, this I'm starting to talk myself into I'm I might fill out a bracket, guys. Uh, 
Um, this is because you want to play the slots at the Flamingo on March twenty eighth. Yeah, you have, fun. You have so, fun with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, on your way to Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> my, uh, yeah, I mean, I I just have to kind of, I hate to be Debbie Downer, but I just I think it's more likely that this team delivers a dud uh, than it does some impressive eye opening victory. Maybe it's not in this game Tuesday, but I don't I don't think this team will win the NIT. I think that maybe it has a win in them, and then they'll just kind of be like. All right, well, that was fun. One last game at home because, uh, well, they could have two games at home. If Yale beats Vanderbilt, they're going to be playing at Chrysler this weekend. Um, obviously, if Vanderbilt wins, Michigan wins, they'll go uh, to Nashville this weekend. That's not a bad trip either for a weekend, but not doing that for the NIT. Um, I just, I have 32 games under my belt to suggest that this team is, it, it's never been a more a clearer picture of the phrase, you are what your record says you are. So, if they be, if they beat Toledo, great. Uh, I just I, I don't. We're gonna cover it and we'll analyze it and we'll treat it like any other game, even though it's not like any other game. It is essentially the Buffalo Wild Wings Bowl tournament, uh, as opposed to the one that actually matters. But um, I don't know. It's I I'm glad they're playing, but I do think the sooner they get to the off season, the better because you're gonna get some clarity on who's going to be back on this team. I mean, they can't, they can't go through the, you know, Musa Diabate, Caleb Houston. Let's just not say anything all the way up to the NBA draft deadline. Um, they need to be aggressive uh, in, in filling any needs they might have. They need to get deeper. They need to get better. They need to get stronger, need to get more athletic. Um, and need to get way more poised. And, and maybe you can get some of that by playing this type of tournament basketball, but um I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't have been upset if they, I honestly, like I'm glad they're playing, but if they didn't play, I wasn't going to sit here and rip them for it either. But uh, if you're invited, you may as well play. And if you're going to play, go win the whole damn thing and hang a banner in your practice facility. So well, that's here's, where I here's the up. thing. Here's the thing too, though, about Michigan laying a dot or whatever. We'll see what happens, but they're also playing a bunch of NIT teams in this tournament. So like, it's not like the other team, is going to be that great either. There are some, including Vanderbilt, that thought they had a chance at the end of getting in or whatever, but you're playing NIT teams, and even if you do have to go on the road to Vanderbilt, who knows who's going to show up to that game. Uh, you know, So that's kind of where things stand. I do want to just throw out this fact because I was doing some NIT research. I'm becoming – I'm just going to be the NIT expert. But uh, Yale is shooting since mid-January 43.1% from three, so that's a dangerous team. They're, look for them in an upset. Um, if ESPN wants to have me on to break down the NIT or anything, just just let me know. But they, they could be a team that upsets, and we may be back at Chrysler on Saturday. I think I would probably prefer to watch that game from home, uh, a game in Nashville, one of many games I would watch that day. But uh, we will see what happens. And you can see that on QVC or the Home Shopping Network. With all due respect. Yeah. With all due respect. <laughs> That's my boy, Hutch. I love Hutch. I was waiting for it, Hutch. I love that guy. He's always on top. That's great. Um, That's pretty much all the energy I have to muster Uh for basketball talk. Do you guys have anything else that's on your mind with this team? With all due respect, I don't. Let's move on. Okay. Well, before we move on, we will talk about our friends over at Rogue Shop. Uh, Check out rogueshop.com if you have issues sleeping, chronic pain, anxiety, stress, have a little back pain I've been going through. Pain cream will be uh, will be used here probably as soon as we get off the air. But uh, they they've been amazing uh, with us. We've we've been with Rogue Shop since football season. Uh, they sell CBD, THC, edibles, tinctures, smokables, bath salts, pain creams, topicals, vapes, candles, soaps. You name it. Uh, they handcraft all of their topicals, soaps, candles, the bath salts, the massage oils, the tinctures. They grow their own cannabis in their own manufacturing facility. And all of their products are made with their own product. Uh, their website has a 24-7 chat function where customers can ask anything. Any of the packages you get are going to be personalized. They will have a handwritten note inside. They'll answer all of your questions online. Um, Richard and Charmaine are big on the education around plant medicine, around cannabis, THC, CBD, all of that. Uh, all of their edibles are custom formulated with cannabis, vitamins, and plant materials. Uh, Rogue Shop is America's number one online dispensary and health and wellness shop operating in Big Big Ten country, of course, out of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. They are true small business, disabled and veteran owned Uh, over at RogueShop.com. Use promo code The Wolverine. Get 10% off your order today. That's R-O-G-U-E. 
shop.com promo code, the Wolverine and fellas. I know that uh, every week we sing their praises. And as far as I know, nothing's changed with how you guys feel about them in the last week or so. I love the pet stuff, man, for my dog. She was going through some hard times and it literally, I mean, helped her a lot. So uh, give that a shot. Uh, she's 10 years old and uh, uh, really made a difference. So between that and when I, you know, after tough losses like Rutgers, when I can't sleep in the hotel, uh, you know what? Boom out like a light. So uh, great stuff. Great people. As we've always said, we'd like our sponsors to, we, we want to be honest with our, our people about our sponsors, uh, uh, just really good down to earth people, great products. Yeah, they are great people. The chat function there on the website. Fantastic because they are a mom and pop shop uh, more or less. And they are going to, uh, answer your questions, tell you what products uh, you need. You know, if you're stressed out, whatever, what your history is with any of this stuff, and uh, they will get you in the right thing. So they did that for us, and uh, they will do it for you as well. All right, again, that's 10% off using promo code The Wolverine over at rogueshop.com. That's R-O-G-U-E-S-H-O-P.com. And I love this read because every time we do it, I get to, uh, I feel like I'm in the Scripps National Spelling Bee. So uh, <laughs> rogueshop.com, promo code The Wolverine. Thanks to our friends, over at Rogue Shop. Uh, fellas, let's switch gears a little bit here. Uh, Michigan's back in the spring. Fo Michigan football is back uh, in, in spring practice mode. Uh, they had a couple weeks ago, we we're off for spring break. Last week, returned to practice. Uh, there was a media availability that uh, shout out to Zach Libby. He got out to for us because we were all in Chicago covering the wet fart of a game against Rutgers. Uh, today, Clayton and I were there uh, for, a, for a trio of players. Uh, Carson Barnhart, Braden McGregor, and why am I blanking on the third? Junior Colson. There we go. Um, Rogue Shop products. Uh, I need the whatever's whatever they have for memory loss. Something I could use a hand with. Uh, fellas, as we get back into spring football mode, I mean, uh, we've all kind of been, you know, obviously weren't there Thursday, but we caught up via the audio. Uh, we've all been writing stuff that we've heard today. Chris, you just put up an inside the fort. Uh, what are our big what are our biggest storylines right now? Because right now it kind of just feels like a continuation of where they've been the last two years. And that's a great thing for them. Uh, we, it is. Clayton and I both both commented today. Brian McGregor came out to talk to the media looking like, uh, you know, uh, probably as as fit as he's looked. I mean, he looks like he's put a lot of muscle on, really taken to the coaching he's getting, the the role that he could have in the expanded pass rush. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like all those guys that we've talked to so far have just added a little bit more to their game and you know in the few months since the end of the season. Yeah, we've heard great things about McGregor. Two things with him, maturity when he first got here, he didn't have it. Uh, and that's uh, similar to a lot of kids that age, right? They're young kids and they come in here and uh, aren't ready. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, but guess what? Uh, now he's a veteran. Now he's a leader. We saw a glimpse of, glimpses of what he can do in that Ohio State game when he was fantastic at times. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when you want your, your good players to be fantastic. Uh, and the other thing with him is it took him a longer time than people expected to get over that, that knee injury. And we wrote about this in inside the fort today too. He hadn't played on the line for 90% of his snaps in high school. So it takes some getting used to, he's got that strength. We're hearing great things about him. They, they have high expectations of him and the defense uh, for, and speaking to people close to the program. They think this defense will be better than last year's defense. And that's saying something guys, uh, as long as that other hold corner holds up, Amari and Walker is off to a great start. Uh, they like what Mike Sainristel can do with that other corner position, even though he doesn't have the great high height that you're looking for. He's got the intensity. He's got the smarts. That kid is a football player. So they love what they're seeing from their linebackers. You know what? Iron sharpens iron. You've got depth there. You've got guys uh, coming. Ernest Hausman is going to play and he's going to push for playing time. He's the real deal. So, uh, and he's only a sophomore. So uh, if, as long as they get what they think they're going to get from the pass rushers uh the interior line they think is going to be better so uh, i love that about them i love a, a good defensive football team and we know we know for a fact that this offense is going to move the ball jj mccarthy is an absolute stud offensive line is going to be fine great um and the running backs are elite uh you got the best pair of running backs as a duo in my opinion in the country at least one of them so when they come back healthy in the summer so the only big question mark and i think clayton wrote about it is the special teams can tommy do 
Doman be the guy? Can, will he handle all duties? I know they don't want him to uh, from the people that we've spoken with. They want, they would like to have different guys doing different things, but if they have to go the Kenny Allen route and let him do all three, then so be it. But they'll have options there too. I uh, love this team. I love where it is. I love the culture. Uh, I love the coaching staff. I think it's one of the best ever. I think Anthony wrote that a couple of weeks ago about how this might be the best staff they have ever have. I read your stuff guys. And it's, uh, and it's great. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you were sweating that one out. Yeah. Uh, but it's great read all stuff. Your stuff too, Chris, for what Thank you. Thank you. That's what I was waiting to hear. So uh, read your guys' stuff but... with, with all due respect, Clayton. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It was, it was, but you know what? This is going to be a good football team, and uh, I don't think there's any question about it. They will be the favorites to win the Big Ten, and they have come back like business as usual and uh, acting like they are the Big Ten champions, the reigning Big Ten champions. There was a headline on ESPN pre, uh, spring preview of the Big Ten, and it said, "Can Ohio State knock off Michigan?" And it's just almost surreal to see that after so many years, and even last season, right? I mean, like. Basically, the national media thought, yeah, Michigan got their one win. It was at home. You know, they were due anyway. It was one in, in 10 years or whatever it was. Yeah, exactly 10 years. And, you know, that was that. Uh, and I think Ohio State kind of thought that too a little bit. I wrote about mm-hmm. this the other day. Like, just some of the comments that they continue to make. C.J. Stroud, if I would have beat Michigan those two times, I, I think I would have had two Heisman trophies. That's a big if. I mean, you guys lost by a combined 37 points. You threw two interceptions at home. Uh, and had also a, a fumble that you know would have taken away one of the interceptions, but that was really costly at the end as well. Game was probably over at that point, but I digress. Um, you got to bring that up every now and then. So, yeah, I mean, it, Michigan definitely, I think, will be the favorite when they do that Cleveland.com media poll, which isn't all that accurate usually. I, I did something on that last year, uh-huh. uh, kind of, you know, just the truth behind, you know, who they pick and, and who ends up winning it. Uh, but, yeah, so, I mean, Michigan – is is feeling that and it feels like an extension of last season which is something we said a year ago at this time and and they go out and win the big 10 again uh but just a couple things that stood out to me over the last couple days listening to these guys talk is one linebacker uh junior colson said there were times last year where he was absolutely exhausted out there because they didn't have much linebacker depth now they have all sorts of depth and nakai hill green is healthier he's out there doing some things in practice. So I think that's big for this team. Ernest Hausman, and go back and watch some of the plays he made against Michigan at the big house last season, including his first career sack on JJ McCarthy, where JJ thought, Oh, I, I got a linebacker. I'm just going to make him miss. And I'm going to be, you know, skirt up the sideline, get out of bounds. No, he brought him down. Uh, and, you know, so he's, he's very talented and I'm going to be excited to see who actually comes out of that and, and gets the majority of the snaps next to junior Colson on the inside. But, um, a, a couple other guys. The Chris Jenkins hype is absolutely real. I mean, he keeps getting brought up. Uh, Braden McGregor called him a monster today. He keeps getting brought up by other guys as well. Uh, his name was mentioned by our friend Angelique Shangelis to Junior Colson. And before she could finish answering her question, he was like, that guy is going to be phenomenal, a, a word that Junior uses a lot, uh, as I learned transcribing his, his words today. But he is, uh, based on what other guys are saying as well. And then Tyler Morris, a guy I, you know, that we kind of were looking at going into spring as well, he keeps getting brought up too. Braden McGregor brought him up unsolicited today uh, that he's really impressing. He switched his jersey number to number eight. And frankly, he looks a hell of a lot like Ronnie Bell did uh, you know, for his years here in some of the pictures that have come out of spring ball. And uh, I think he could be that type of guy. He already had some of the Ronnie Bell traits, but AB and I were talking about in the parking lot earlier. I mean, maybe he could be better than Ronnie Bell one day. Who knows? Uh, so excited about those guys. But, yeah, I mean, the, the overarching thing is that all these guys are back to win a natty. Uh, all these guys are super motivated. And once they get some of these guys healthy going into fall camp, we're going to see uh, things really come into to form here. And uh, it's going to be fun. But uh, I'm excited to see what happens here in a couple weeks at the big house as well. Yeah, for me – Right now, I mean, the cornerbacks, I mean, that the depth there is still a work in progress. I won't call it a concern. I won't call it a question mark. I'll call it a work in progress because they could, you know, if they don't like what they see coming out of spring football, as we said before, we could see them dip into the portal. Yeah. Uh, they could continue to cultivate the depth they already have. So, again, work in progress is the designation there. But, you know, in, in all of my time covering Michigan, it's been, I think this is, would be football season 10 for me. Um, the depth is as good as it's ever been. 
I, I think that the talent, the, the potential star power at every position is, is probably about as good as it's ever been. I think you have the best quarterback that you've had easily in the Jim Harbaugh era. Uh, all the ingredients are there and spring football, you know, it used to be spring football used to be emblematic of, you know, a new, you know, a new beginning, you know, okay. Last year's team didn't accomplish this goal, but uh, maybe things will be different this time around. We'll see some guy go out in the spring game and, and emerge as, as the next star on the roster. Now it's like, it's more of a formality. It's just a step into, okay, you're winning big 10 titles again. You're getting to the college football playoff. Obviously there's a glass ceiling that they need to keep breaking through and get a, you know, they need to get a postseason win now, a bowl win, a college football playoff win. That's the next thing on the table for them. Uh, but right now, I mean, Chris, I mean, you can probably speak to it obviously more than I can from a from a coaching staff perspective, from a depth perspective, from a culture and pedigree perspective. Things are probably as good as they've ever been. And this this is a, a top two team heading into next year. I think Georgia will probably be favored to run the table again, but you know, they've got all the pieces to, to make a run at this thing. And that's what gets me, you know, spring football is more of an appetizer now, whereas mm-hmm. before it was maybe, you know, okay, well, we'll see what this group has in store for, uh, for the upcoming season. Yeah. Just win the big 10 and go from there guys. And if you know what, to me, as I've said, it's kind of gravy after that, just because it's hard to compete. I was talking to somebody today who was close to the program and, you know, he said, you know, <clears throat> you win the big 10 now, I always thought that we would win the Big Ten and then one, you know, maybe once every four, three, four years, go to the playoff and compete. And, you know, now you got back to back and you're you're going to be favored to do it again. That's pretty remarkable in an era in which people are playing by a different set of rules, which has really been the case for the last, you know, several decades for Michigan. So, you know, we can go back to the Bo Schembechler era. You know, I read his book, read his book and, and the things that he was dealing with on the recruiting trail. There was some guy from a high school that was asking for 10,000 bucks for a couple of his players in 1983, you know, and he said, yeah, right. And Bo said, you know what? He he said they ended up at Kentucky. You know, I don't know what uh, happened to the guy, to the coach, but he got him on film or he got him on uh, tape saying, you know, saying, hey, this is what my players are being sold for. He gave it to the NCAA and they didn't do shit about it. So that's what you've been dealing with for the last 40 years, uh, 50, 60, 70 years. Who knows, man, how long it's been going on. But uh, so at the same time, make maximize your the talent that you have and they've got a ton of it and somebody told us last year fellas uh, that's close to the program who's been around for several years who's part of the program he said there this reminds me of the 1990s the early 90s when we were stacked at every position and the expectation was to go out there and compete and win for big 10 championships and this team is no different so i love it i love the leadership i love jj mccarthy I love Blake Corum. I love where the offensive line is. There's not one part of this program where I can look at it and say, this is going to be an issue. Uh, there are some, like like Anthony said, you know, there, there may be little concerns here and there, but overall they are on very, very solid ground. I love Lamp. I love Lamp too. Yeah. Um, 100%. No, but but totally. And uh, it is interesting too. Like I, I, I agree. The Big Ten would be a success. As Doug Skeen would say, the expectation, right, the goal – is to win the Big Ten championship. That'll never change at Michigan. These guys are talking higher, you know, than that. Uh, their menu every day uh, up on the up on the screen at Schembechler Hall. At the bottom of it, it says Houston or bust. Uh, you know, that's the national championship will be played there. And Carson Barnhart says today, we're not here to win Big Ten championship games. He said, okay, well, I mean, we are, but we want to win the national championship. We're here to win a national championship. So part of me is like, man, look at it a little bit broader and, and be like, yeah, the Big Ten and then it's – you know, maybe not gravy after that. Like you still are going to go after it, but that that's still the main goal, I think. Uh, and I think those guys understand it, but they're, if they're in a position right now, like they are to get more than that, then then go and do it. Uh, you know, they feel like that, you know, a lot of them were saying that they, they're kind of over that TCU loss, but they, they still think about it quite a bit and they're using it as fuel. So, Hey, you got, you know, blown out by Georgia one year in, in the semis, you were so, so close to beating TCU this past season maybe they'll take that next step this year and then you never know what can happen on that last monday night but they're in a really really good spot the fact that we're talking about you know what what should be the goal big 10 or national championship i know people have talked about that on our message board as well that's a great great problem to have if you're a michigan fan and uh you know hopefully they can enjoy the ride and hopefully they can start to recruit a little bit better so that the ride continues longer than uh you know just the immediate future 
Yeah. I mean, for me, the, the, I keep saying for me, it's, it's my version of with all due respect uh, tonight, I guess, but um, <laughs> this is a, this is a, I, I don't think this is, it all depends on who's back next year, but with all the talent that did come back, this does feel like the third part of a trilogy where, you know, how this era, how we remember this era of, of Michigan will probably by and large, um, you know, this year will have a lot to do in how it's seen. I mean, if you go out and I know big 10 championships, there are still people that will maintain that's the be all end all. I mean, we are in a national championship college football playoff world now. Um, you know, that's so yeah. Beating Ohio state is probably inherently going to get you there. I say, just do it all. I mean, that's the most ideal outcome. Um, you know, the playoffs going to expand. This is the last year where it will just be the four teams in there. Uh, and the elephant in the room is that you know, we don't know how much longer, you know, Michigan's struggled on the recruiting trail, struggled with NIL. We don't know when the next time they'll have a roster that's this stacked and this talented is. And, you know, I'd rather like, you could, you could just have your cake and eat it to this year. Um, I know we think that there are big things coming with them in terms of how they attack NIL and the recruiting has got better uh, of late, but yeah, uh, that's, that's going to be, that's the expectation. And I like to hear that the players are kind of embracing that because when there's, you know, they've done everything else. They've knocked off so many narratives in the last few years. It's been you know really remarkable to see. So any other thoughts on spring football? We'll, we'll probably close this out with a few, uh, few questions here from the people who have been watching. Let's go to questions. All right. We're going to go back to, it's more of questions and comments. We're going to clean this up. Everything that starred here from producer Hutch. Shout out to him behind the scenes. This is from uh, Morani Lewis, who says, going back to Michigan basketball, this team needs to know the plays. Hunter having to consistently point out where players are supposed to be is insane. Um, that that I've noticed that a lot this year. And I think we talked about a little bit earlier where guys would we'd see Jet Howard making a mistake and guys would point to him and or there, he'd point back and there'd be a little bit of an on-court bicker. Um, Guys not knowing where they're supposed to be. Uh, and I think it ties into a question here from Dave Mays. So I'll tie both of these together. Do you feel Juwan is still learning as a coach? And could this year be an indicator? Yeah. Uh, you know what? There's no substitute for experience. And this is not <laughs> criticism. That You look at everybody's like, oh, jo John Beeline would have done this. John Beeline was a coach for what, 39, 40 years or something like that when he was making these decisions at the end of the games? More when people brought up, you know what? Oh, and, you know, before Juwan got there in the four years prior, Michigan was 13 and six in one score games. And since then, they're like four and 13 or whatever. And I'm like, well, there are things at the end of games that if you are a coach and you've been around forever you're going to get a good feel for it and the more you see the more you learn so yeah there are some head scratching decisions at times from with Juwan Howard and his and his substitutions for example uh there was a time when he had four guys on the floor that couldn't score and I'm thinking where are the points coming from you lose four points there in that situation which they did with that lineup on the floor and in a game like Rutgers, when they play that great a defense, it's going to be hard to make that up. So uh, that's one thing. You know what? And I think uh, in fairness to him, uh, it is hard to coach your kid flat out, man, uh, because Chet Howard has some learning to do. And as a father, uh, I know there's no question in my mind that Juwan Howard wants what's best for Michigan as a father. Sometimes, you know what, it is hard to criticize your child compared to somebody else. And again, I'm not saying that happened a lot, but uh, you know what, it's it's a tough balance. Let's just put it that way. So uh, I do believe that he's still learning and I think that he will continue to get better. He runs great stuff and anybody who says he doesn't is full of it. There are some plays that he runs that it's just next level stuff. Now, can he improve there too? Absolutely. There are ways that Purdue posts Zach Eady, for example, and finds ways to get him lower when they set up a high school buddy of mine, a coach buddy of mine pointed it out to me where Michigan should be doing more of this to get Hunter down low. So he doesn't have to work so hard to get positioned. So, but these are things that he will learn as he becomes, you know, uh, more entrenched as a head coach, which, and he's going to continue to be, he's uh, there. He's got a lot of great qualities as a basketball coach. Yeah. I think Jawan Howard would be the first one to tell you that he's still learning. He talks about that mm -hmm. a lot, the whole growth mindset thing. He says he's still growing. Uh, that sort of thing. That's why he meets with guys like Jay Wright and things like that to pick up nuggets that he's going to implement. So yeah, I, I think uh, absolutely. He's still learning as a coach. 
And yeah, maybe, you know, the version of Juwan Howard, let's say he's here 10 more years. In 10 years down the road, that version of Juwan Howard maybe would have taken this team to the NCAA tournament. They would have found a way to win one or two or three or four more games to get in. And that's just kind of, you know, part of the risk you take when you hire a guy like Juwan Howard who didn't have head coaching experience. I thought it was the right hire. I thought it was a good hire. Uh, and he'll continue to learn. And as far as uh, Marani Lewis's question about, you know, Hunter pointing out where, where guys are supposed to be and things like that. Uh, I almost think this team needed more of that, more of when you make a mistake, holding each other accountable. You know, what would Charles Matthews have said or Zach Novak have said, uh, you know, if you missed a box out or something like that, you need that because uh, it even ties in actually to what junior Colson was talking about in the football side today. But, you know, coaches can tell you a billion different things, but sometimes the best teaching and, and uh, the best coaching comes from, your fellow players because you know you're in the trenches with them you trust them you know that they're seeing the same things on the field as you so i think they need a little bit more of that and frankly if hunter comes back i'd like to see him maybe be uh, a little bit tougher on his teammates at times you know in the right way to to make sure hey we're not losing these games like we're not gonna cut the corners uh, they need to touch every line as john beeline would say and do all the little bit the little things right um so I, I honestly i'd like to see a little bit more of that type of stuff yeah, I feel like if whether this group stays intact or not, um, we'll see what the roster looks like next year. Player player leadership and increased on court leadership, I think, would will do wonders for them, just as it did. I mean, that Michigan football's turnaround in twenty twenty one was a player led, player driven um, movement that was supported by the infrastructure around them, with uh, you know the coaching staff and all that. So. Yeah, I would love to see more of that. Let's uh, let's switch back to football here. Uh, some wide receiver talk. Uh, Red Sox lover 216. I'll never forgive uh, the Red Sox for 2013 ALCS, by the way. Uh, says Tyler Morris is going to be him. Guy that uh, I think all three of us are high on in terms of someone who kind of reminds me of a Ronnie Bell in a, in a, in a way that you know we're, t- we're always talking about Darius Clemens and talking about you know some of the other highly more highly recruited guys. Uh, Maureen Walker's getting... Uh, buzz at cornerback now before it was wide receiver um like tyler morris i think we're all on board with that uh chase wants to talk about roman wilson and darius clemens he thinks they're both in for really good seasons chris i think you wrote about this uh recently. yeah i'm not going to give it away but chase go to our inside the fort today uh, for a little nugget on roman wilson you want to talk about a guy who can fly uh there's some good stuff in there about him uh and yeah i don't think there's any question and by the way uh ab uh, with all due respect, Jim Leland should have had, he must have manure for his brains to take out Max Scherzer in 2013, right? In the seventh inning. And Torrey Hunter should have caught that home run ball by, um, who was it? Big Poppy? It was Big Poppy, yep. Yeah, so. Yeah, the security, guard, the security yeah. guard caught it. Yeah, yeah, well, Torrey should have had it. So anyway, I know my dad would have caught it. Uh, is, is what he would have said. He would have made the play. <laughs> so anyway, um, but you're. I think you're right. And here's the thing. Um Clemens was the one getting all the buzz last year, Chase, and did not live up to expectations. But I think you are going to see him continue. Uh, I think you're going to make see him as a potential breakout player this year. This guy was really turning heads last year. It's all really between the ears. So come out with a, a vengeance, and I think he'll have a good year. I agree. We talked about Tyler Morris earlier, but Darius Clemens could take a big leap. I mean, remember the plays that he made in the spring game, including his diving touchdown yes. catch? in the end zone. I mean, he's capable of that sort of thing. So if he puts it all together uh, and I know for a fact, he was looking at this spring as a really big opportunity for him to kind of seize one of those open jobs at wide receiver. So we'll, we'll see what he does there. Roman Wilson uh, been high on him for a while, but I think he could take a big leap and uh, you know, Cornelius Johnson is probably the safest pick to maybe lead this team in receiving, but Roman Wilson would be right there to me if he can stay healthy the whole season. So uh, we will see what those wide outs do, but you know, sometimes in like you don't want to lose a guy like Ronnie Bell. If Ronnie said, hey, I want to use that last year and come back for a sixth, obviously you would be elated to have it. But sometimes some turnovers are good and it gives guys opportunity and puts a little bit of pressure on them to to step up. And I think Michigan has enough talent for that to happen this season. So the wideout should be good in a year of J.J. McCarthy in the offseason, throwing to these guys, being the number one guy unquestioned uh, and being healthy in the offseason, I think is just massive for this wide receiving core for the whole team uh, that they kind of know who the face is. They know what the identity is and now they can go, you know, achieve those goals and hit the ground running. Yeah. And it's important to remember too, that 
in order to get on the field at Michigan at wide receiver, and I know this is polarizing to some, uh, but you got to be able to block too, uh, because they're going to run the football a lot. And, you know, that's hard for seniors to get down, let alone true freshmen. So the fact that Darius Clemens didn't make the impact, maybe we thought he would, uh, despite him. I mean, you look at, we saw him on the field last spring and thought, wow, I mean, he looks the part of a guy who's played wide receiver in college, but you know, there's a physicality, there's a speed, there is a um, mentality. These guys, a mentality too. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a mentality thing. And, a lot of these guys, we saw this from Donovan Peoples Jones when he came out of high school. You know, a lot of those guys don't run very advanced route trees in high school. They're just kind of running straight down the field. Or, um, you know, in DPJ's case, he was basically just a punt or a kick and punt returner who took pretty much everything back in the uh, back to the house at that level. So, you know, there's there's fine tuning, there's development. Um, you know, Clemens, I think, is a, as good a candidate as any to, to take that leap. So. It uh, could create an interesting scenario too, where maybe he does take that leap and you've got him and Cornelius Johnson on the outside. Maybe you could put Roman Wilson in the slot, uh, have him attack from that way a little bit more. I think Michigan needs to be a little more creative with how they get Roman Wilson, the football, uh, you know, what they did with him in the non-conference. What did he have? Like four touchdowns in his first, like five offensive touches of the season or something like that. And it just kind of went away the rest of the year. So he was banged up a little at times too. Yeah. He got, but then we saw Iowa. it. Yep. And then we saw a TCU man. You know what? Mm -hmm. He had two touchdowns, really, but they only gave him credit for one. Yeah. Oh God, it's yeah. it's still too soon for that. It but is. Yeah, I I think it just kind of goes back to liking where this team is at, liking you know they're they're a good mixture of veteran guys, young guys that we think are going to take a leap, and we'll see as it gets you know spring football is only going to ramp up here over the next few weeks, culminating in that spring game on April first. So. Uh, fellas, I think this is a good place to call it tonight, unless you have any other final thoughts to share with all due respect. With all due respect. I appreciate it. Neil Wiggins, can Michigan win the 10? Neil, with yeah, all what due about respect, this one? with all due respect, I don't give a damn. No, I, I think they can. <laughs> I, I would, really don't think they will. I don't think that this team, uh, cares enough to go out and get it. That's just my opinion. Yeah. I, I don't think they will either. I mean, it, obviously it's easier to say that to take the field rather than, one of the 32 teams, but I think they can. Uh, they certainly have the talent. If they did, they have the best player in the tournament, probably. Uh, and maybe that depends on how healthy Villanova is. If they're getting healthier, maybe they're a, a, a team that could win it. Rutgers uh, is a team that could win it, but Michigan's got as good a chance as anybody if they are, you know, super motivated to do that. But uh, can they? Yes. Will they? We will see. And it starts with Toledo tomorrow night. Yeah, I have no. I don't even know if they're going to win a game tomorrow night. So for me to sit here and say if they could win the NIT or not, I don't know. I guess I haven't really taken that close of a look at the bracket either. But uh, I actually think Rutgers would be a, a, a not maybe not a sneaky good pick. It's a Big Ten team, uh, but the way they defend, the way they come after you, I think that they're going to do that regardless. And given that I think a lot of teams are in this thing and might kind of mail it in, I think that might catch a lot of people by surprise or, or catch him off guard. So we'll see what happens. Uh, fellas, Clayton Safey, Chris Ballas, thank you again for your time. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, leave a like on the video below. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Find us in the podcast feed, uh, whatever podcast app you use, Apple, Google, Spotify. Leave us a nice review. Uh, you can get on the Wolverine subscription train for $29.99, which will get you unlimited access through August 31st. So, that's a great deal to take advantage of. Do that while you still can. Uh, every day that you let that opportunity pass, the deal gets a little less worth it for you. So get on that as soon as you can. Chris put it up and inside the fort. A lot of great premium stuff coming from our site uh, in all sports and also uh, with recruiting. So, uh, fellas, thank you so much. Uh, the three of us will be back Thursday. Chris will be guesting with uh, John Borton and Tom Crawford on Wednesday. They're changing their show for this week because of the NIT game tomorrow night. So uh, a triple dose of Chris Ballas for you this week on the Wolverine YouTube channel. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, guys, we will talk to you soon.